Sensors of all kinds are a key element when it comes to layout automation and there are plenty of videos on YouTube about using infrared sensors, current sensors and the like. Hall effect sensors on the other hand appear to be the model railroader's red-headed stepchild. And this for valid reasons. They need a magnet for activation and can only switch on and off. At least so I thought until I found this one. Welcome to the IOTT channel. I am Hans Tanner. A Hall sensor named after physicist Edwin Hall is a type of sensor which detects the presence and magnitude of a magnetic field. Commercially available sensors come with different variants of the output signal. There are Hall sensors that output an amplified version of the analog signal. Hall switches convert the analog signal to digital and typically come with an open collector output. Most have an active output while the magnetic field is present. And finally there are Hall latches that switch on if the applied field has one polarity and off if the polarity of the magnetic field is reversed and if there is no field the current status remains active. A popular application of using a Hall sensor is to build a tachometer. A magnet sits on the side of a flywheel and gives a pulse every time it crosses in front of the sensor. The pulse rate is then used to compute the RPMs of the flywheel. Searching for model railroad related applications does not produce a lot of results. There is a video showing how a Hall sensor is used to index a turntable. Other applications make use of it to switch the lights inside a rail car when entering and leaving a station or to activate a horn when entering a tunnel. One application uses Hall sensors for train detection for a simple signaling system. And there might be more but as we see from these examples Hall sensors are used for rather simple applications typically using an on-off signal as input element. But recently I came across a new type of Hall sensor from Texas Instruments. In fact I was looking into using a Hall sensor as a distance measuring element for a track measuring car similar to the one from Pico. Now Pico is using an optical sensor with segments of the wheel painted black and white to give about 8 pulses per revolution. The disadvantage is that it requires either electrical or optical wires to go underneath the car's chassis which is not easy to do. Neither is it easy to shrink it down to end scale. So I was looking into making the axle magnetic and using a Hall sensor inside the car for the detection, similar to those countless tachometer applications. Unfortunately that approach would only result in one pulse per revolution or two if I used a sensor that could report the direction of the magnetic field. Then I thought that if I would mount two sensors at 90 degrees from each other I would get two overlapping sine waves that would allow me to determine the current rotation angle of the magnetized axle. I then wondered if someone had done that before and searched for publications dealing with two-dimensional measurement of magnetic fields. That's how I came across this application report from Texas Instruments, where they describe exactly my intended application including all the mathematics needed to normalize the field measurements and to determine the current rotation angle. And the paper claimed that they also have a chip that has a 3-axis Hall sensor and can do exactly that and that is the TMAC 5170 featuring an SPI bus for communication. The same device is also available for I2C communication as TMAC 5273. The Hall elements and internal functionality are identical and both are available in two versions, A1 with a sensitivity up to 100 millitesla and version A2 with a range of up to 300 millitesla. They also offer a development kit that allows for testing the chip from a PC. 
Unfortunately, none of the large US distributors had the chip available, so I ordered it from TI directly and they shipped it from their Singapore warehouse. I got five of them for about $20 including shipping and a week later they showed up in my mailbox. Time to play. First I soldered the chip on a small breakout board so that I could use it on a prototyping board. This actually was a little bit of a challenge as the chip is using a 0.65mm pitch. I carefully applied just a little soldering paste and heated the board with a hot air gun. Most of the pins were ok, I only had one solder bridge between two of the pins which I removed with some copper wick. I then connected it to an ESP32, this time one of the VMOS boards with integrated battery holder so that I could place the detector in a boxcar and run it without USB cable. Since the sensor chip has only been on the market for a little more than one year, software support is not all that great. On GitHub there is one library published by Texas Instruments, but I was not able to make it work out of the box neither on the ESP32 nor on a standard Arduino. Luckily I found a project webpage from Dave Price at the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms. Dave used this chip for a project and also published his software support for it. So I used Dave's working code to debug the library from TI and ended up with my own library version that appears to be working properly. There are a few additional features I need to put in to make it more flexible and then I will upload it to my GitHub page. With the software implemented I was ready to figure out what the chip actually can do. After completion of the installation I wrote a small example program to read and display the magnetic flux in the plotter of the Arduino IDE. When rotating the magnet above the sensor, the sine waves of the three axles are visualized and we can clearly see the 90 degree offset between two of the axles. So the sensor worked and it was time for a real test. The first thing I tried was using the TMAC5170 as axle counter. For that I placed it underneath the track and installed a small magnet on the frame of a car. I then wrote a simple sketch that initializes the sensor and then simply reads the magnetic values of each axis and displays it in the built-in plotter window of the Arduino IDE. When the car is pushed over the sensor we can see two of the sensors giving a pulsing signal, similar to the output of an optical encoder. This allows to detect the presence of the car and its direction as well, so this is a clear advantage compared to a single hall element which only can detect presence. So with this approach it would easily be possible to implement a block detector system that knows how many cars or locos are in a particular block simply based on counting the in and outgoing cars at each block boundary. Watch video number 40 for more information on this concept. The negative point of course is that every car needs to be equipped with a small magnet in order to make it detectable, which is a little bit of a hassle. And the second negative point is that this concept does not allow for vehicle identification as it would be possible for example with NFC technology, for example RFID. But after all, building an axle counter was not my intention. I only did it to get to know the TMAC chip a little bit better. So next I built a small 3D printed holder to install two magnets around the axle of a car so that they would rotate with the wheel. Since each part of the holder has its own magnet, the two sides attract each other and keep the holder in place while the cutout for the axle ensures a correct alignment so that the magnetic fields of the two magnets merge together and look just like one field that is rotating as the wheels turn. Then I simply placed my prototype board inside the boxcar so that the TMAC chip was located right above the center of the axle with the magnets. For this application I used a built-in function of the sensor 
which is providing direct output of the angle of the applied magnetic field. So all that complicated math formulas that were explained in the application report paper are built in as a function inside the chip and it is possible to directly read the angle of the magnetic field or the rotation angle of the axle in my case. And this up to 20,000 times per second. Furthermore, there are various configuration options to adjust the sensors to the strength of the magnetic field, normalize the field strength between the axes of the sensor and even select two of the three axes to be considered to calculate the rotation angle. Of course, this depends on how the magnet is mounted in relation to the sensor. Next, I made a few adjustments to the IoT stick software to support that new sensor and was then able to send the sensor output to a monitor web page as it is always the case with the IoT stick. When opening the monitor page, we see four data elements that are updated once per second. The current angle of the axle, the current speed of the car, the absolute and relative travel distance. Absolute means the travel distance is always added independent of the travel direction. Relative, on the other hand, means that the distance is added in one direction and subtracted in the other. So if the car travels from point A to point B, then reverses direction and travels back to point A, the absolute distance should be twice the distance from A to B, while the relative distance should be back to zero. The setup part of the page allows for setting the diameter of the wheel, which is needed to convert the rotation angle of the axle into speed and distance data. The second configuration element is the magnetic threshold. This specifies the angle the axles need to rotate in the opposite direction before the software assumes that the travel direction has changed. This is an important value if the car is at a standstill. Depending on the strength of the magnetic field, for example the distance between the axle magnets and the sensor, the controller might read different values floating around the current position. If it would interpret each value as either forward or reverse movement, the absolute distance counter would continue to increase, while the relative counter would increment and decrement but largely stay the same. By setting this threshold, that oscillation can be avoided. As mentioned, the data on the web page is updated once every second, but the software on the ESP32 is reading the sensor every 10 milliseconds, so it calculates travel distance and speed 100 times per second. The sensor itself does 720 increments per full revolution, so with 31 mm wheel diameter the theoretical resolution is 0.135 mm or about 1 two hundredths of an inch. To test the performance of the sensor, I built a track oval and let the sensor measure the length of the track in both directions and at speed settings of 25, 50 and 75% of maximum speed. But before I did that, I did a simple 3 lap out and return test to get a first impression of the precision that is possible. The track is made from sectional LGB track. The curves use radius R1 of 600 mm and the straight sections measure 2.7 meters. So the total length of the oval along the track's center line is 9.18 meters or around 30 feet. The 31.35 mm indicated as wheel diameter is measured at the center of the conical part of the wheel, which should be the average diameter when the wheel is on a straight track. In the curves, this is different. When pulled, the wheel is most likely locked to the inside rail, so there is some slipping on the outside. And when the car is pushed, it most likely will be the other way around. The length difference between inside and outside rail is about 270 mm for a full circle, so we should not be surprised if there is a difference depending on the car being pulled or pushed. So let's run the car around the oval for three times, then change direction and run it three times in the other direction. 
going out gives us a total of 27.586 meters. That is close to the theoretical length of 27.54 meters. So the wheel diameter settings appear to be correct. Now changing direction and traveling back. Here are the results. The absolute distance is now 55.473 meters, so about twice the distance as before. And the relative distance is at minus 199 millimeters, so pretty close to the theoretical zero, and negative as expected because the car tends to measure the length of the outside rail when being pushed. I then ran all the other tests and here is the table with the results. As we can see there is a deviation depending on direction and pushed versus pull. At the moment I have no explanation for this but what is interesting is that the amount is very close to one wheel revolution. I will investigate that further but chances are that there is a calculation error when changing direction. I just was not able to find it so far. On the other hand, going the same way and using the same traction type, the result is independent of the speed of the locomotive, which is very good. Overall the results are within plus minus 1% of the real track length, which I think is quite acceptable. Now if you looked at my board, you probably noticed that there are other sensors on there besides the TMAC 5170. Those are the BME 280 and the BNO 055, both from Bosch. Why I installed them and what additional data I used them to measure are topics of some upcoming videos as I am currently still working on these things. But I can already tell you it will be exciting and if you don't want to miss it, you should subscribe to the IOTT channel and hit the bell icon so that you are in the loop when new videos come out. And that's it for today's video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and you have now some ideas for trying this really exciting sensor in your own projects. If so, please click the like button below to let me know and help to promote this video. And not only this video, but also the IOTT channel itself, because as you probably know, YouTube likes the likes. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.